Hello and welcome to Restoration DIY. In this episode, I'm going to make a segmented bowl. I've done one similar before, but this one will be different as it will be finished in iridescent paint and it will also be a two part video. So let's get into it. I began by squaring the timber on the planar thicknesser. I get the required sizes from a 3D CAD model I create. I do this for all my segmented projects. I can then use the model to give me a plan and section view. With two sides squared up, I ran each piece of timber through the bandsaw, with two millimetres added to the final dimension. The excess will be taken off with the thicknesser. On my previous segmented projects, I used the table saw for this, but now I have the bandsaw, I feel much safer and it's a lot quieter. The camera angle doesn't quite show it, but my fingers are not getting close to the blade and this doesn't kick back like the other saw could do. I'm not going to show too much of this bit. The camera angle was well rubbish, but you get the gist. I passed each piece through the thicknesser until it was to the correct size. And with that done, I could cut the individual segments. There are four rings in this project and a solid base piece. Each ring contains 18 segments, so they require a 10 degree angle on either end. Except for the top two rings, the length of each piece differs from one ring to the next. The dimension is taken from the plan view. Once all the segments were cut, each one had to be sanded to remove any scraggy bits before gluing up into the finished rings. The glue I'm using is Type Bond 2, liberally applied to one side of each segment. It's important not to scrimp on this bit. A lot of the glue will be absorbed by the segments, and if you don't apply enough, you could end up with a dry joint, which happened to me a few months back, and the resulting rapid unplanned disassembly of the bowl while spinning at 1000 RPM on the lathe was interesting to say the least. When each ring is loosely assembled, I use hose clamps to add the required clamping pressure, giving the segments a gentle tap with a hammer to seat them properly before fully tightening the screw. When I clamp thicker segments, I use two sets of clamps, one at the bottom and one at the top. went together very easily without the need to make any adjustments to the angles to get a good fit. This is mainly down to using a purpose-made jig on the table saw. It was easy to make, it's just a piece of 12mm ply with a tight-fitting oak rail glued and screwed to the underside that runs in the table saw track and a fence glued and screwed to the top at a 10 degree angle. The solid base piece is made up of two pieces of timber glued together, approximately 120mm square and 25mm thick. The lower piece is sacrificial and will be used to form a tenon for mounting the blank in the forge or chuck. It's the next day and the glue has had plenty of time to cure. So after removing the clamps from the base piece and the four rings, I checked each one for dry joints. Then it was time for the drum sander to get everything nice and flat. The drum sander is an awesome machine and makes light work of leveling and flattening the rings and base piece. I have found that alternating the sides and rotating the pieces being sanded helps to get a much more consistent result. I have 100 grit sandpaper in the drum at the moment, which is not at its best, but it still gets the job done. Also for note, before each time I use it, I check that the paper is still tightly wound onto the drum. If it's slack, it will snag and rip. Before I could glue up the blank, I had to do some work on the base piece. First off, 
I marked two circles, one for the outer diameter and one for the tenon. Then it was over to the bandsaw to take the corners off. With the corners removed, I mounted the base in the coal jaws and held it firmly in place with the tailstock. Then I set to forming the tenon using a 3 8 bowl gouge. The size of the tenon is a diameter of 80 millimeters and about eight millimeters deep. So the four jaw chuck can get a good grip. And with the base mounted in the four jaw chuck, using the 3 8 bowl gouge, I could get it to round and more or less to the finished diameter of the foot. So with the base piece finished for now, you join me part way into gluing up the blank. Type Bond 2 is used, liberally applied before adding the next ring, which is centered and held in place with hot melt glue. The segments in each ring are half lapped to form a brick pattern, and the hot melt glue does a great job of holding the rings together, as without it, they tend to slide all over the place when you add clamping pressure. I've seen some people adding salt to the glue joints to provide some grip, but personally I haven't tried that method. Once the last two pieces were added, I placed a length of timber across the top to span the full width of the table saw, then I simply added two clamps to provide good clamping pressure to the joints. I left it overnight to cure and with the clamps removed, I tightened the chuck onto the tenon and mounted the blank to the lathe. The chuck had such a good grip I didn't see the need to use the tailstock for additional support. With the lathe spinning at around 800 RPM, I started turning using a 3 8 bowl gouge. As with all turning projects, the first job is to get the blank to round and balanced. The ash timber cut very well, though until I had it in balance, Shear scraping seemed to give the best results. Until I hollowed out the inside, the blank would not be perfectly balanced, but it was good enough to turn the speed up to around 1000 RPM and get to work forming the outside of the bowl. After a quick change of camera angle, I continued removing material, shaping the bowl from the base into the side. I stuck with the 3 8 bowl gouge with a series of push cuts along with some more shear scraping, edging closer to the finished surface. When I got close to the desired shape, I switched to the skew chisel to remove the residual tool marks and blend and fair the curves from the top into the base. I had to remove the chuck and move the banjo to the other side of the bowl to get the tool post close enough to work on the base. With that done, I used a 3 8 bowl gouge to create the cutout, working either side of the cut to get to the required depth, which, as ever, is when I decide it looks okay. Using the gouge to shear scrape, I blended the base piece into the bowl, being extra careful not to get a catch, which would have been difficult to fix as I was very close to the finished surface. The final go with the bowl gouge to define the cutout profile, then I used a skew chisel to fine tune the surface, ready for sanding. sanded from 80 to 320 grit and with that done I then began hollowing out the inside. Hollowing out was fairly straightforward. I began with a 3 8 bowl gouge but this has a swept back fingernail grind so it is hard to get it to cut on the flattered surfaces in the base. So I had to resort to the Easywood Tools carbide cutters to remove the bulk of the material in that area.
I alternated between the bowl gouge and the carbide cutters, removing material being careful to check the thickness of the bowl as I went along. The bit with not much to play with was the joint between the second and third ring, basically where the bowl flattens out, as indicated on screen. As more material was removed in the base, I could get a better angle to use the bowl gouge, but it was still a bit tricky, so I went back to the carbide cutters. I used the large carbide cutter to finalise the shape and then broke out the large negative rate scraper to blend and fair the base into the side. After a final cut with a bowl gouge on the rim, it was time for sanding from 80 to 320 grit. Sanding done, I applied two thorough coats of sanding sealer, which had denibbed with a non abrasive scotch pad. After the sanding sealer was good and dry, I began the iridescent painting process. First off, I had to mask off all the parts I didn't want to paint. I decided to leave the base unpainted. So I mask that area off, also wrapping tape around the chuck to keep that clean as well. With that done, I then had to mask off the top to protect the inside of the bowl from overspray. Note how wide the rim is, a nice feature, but it also gives plenty of sticking area for the tape. Once half the bowl was covered, I used a sharp utility knife to trim the tape flush with the edge of the bowl. covered and the bowl safely reattached to the lathe, I trimmed the remaining tape back flush with the rim. All done, I could start painting. I used Arteza iridescent paints applied with an airbrush. The paint needs to be thinned down so for that I used Vallejo Flow Improver, mixed at around 60-40, the paint being the lesser amount, with the air pressure set to about 18-20 to 20 psi. The chosen colour for the base coat was fancy black. I applied three coats of paint and I was very impressed with how good it looked, though this is just the first stage. Once this base coat had dried, I could begin masking for the next stage, which we'll have to wait for part two, because at the time of editing this video, I still have some work to do to finish it. So as this video plays out, part two will be uploaded in a few days, or if you're watching this in the future, it's the next episode. I would like to thank you all for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this one. Smash that like button, and subscribe if you haven't already, and comments, are always welcome. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye for now.